We will want to say, for the record, you should obey the law. Uh, the challenge that you face is uh, do you obey state law or federal law? And those states that have legalized, like Colorado. Um, mm. And so in Oregon, but you know, I, we have, through our microdose.me study, and, and doctors have, are collecting hundreds and hundreds of case uh, reports where people have gotten off their antidepressive medicines with microdosing. And so attentive physicians are always looking for these uh, the N of 1 studies, one of these remarkable uh, breakthroughs that are not conventional, and they end up documenting it. There's actually journals, it was basically, uh, on best uh, out outcome cases where they were given a diagnosis for which there was no apparent remedy, and then you know, they stumbled upon something. So when you start getting hundreds and hundreds of these case reports, then clinicians wake up. They begin to look at this, saying, wow, there is something happening here. We need to study it. And so I think that's good. You know, with this grassroots movement is populating databases, giving information that physicians otherwise would not see if they only saw 100 patients a month, and you've got 100,000 people reporting, now you're starting to see something, and then the clinicians pay attention for this. For people who, don't, who were not there yesterday, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there's 120 clinical trials registered on psilocybin at clinicaltrials.gov. That's extraordinary. There was one back in 1999, right? Yeah. So, so that, that means that the people are paying attention to this. There is a lot of hype and high expectation, but as more of these clinical trials are published, it's you know, amazing to me that many of these high expectations, which seem to be extraordinary or even over-exaggerated, are now become substantiated. Alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, to kicking tobacco, I mean, this is, these are three yeah. different types of drugs, three different types of receptors, and yet is fundamentally changing the, the neurological health of these addicts. Uh, so the, the chorus of data is, is actually substantiating increasingly these extraordinary claims that heretofore were looked upon as being exaggerations, and it's, it's looking more and more real. Yep. On the other hand, People who have treatment-resistant depression, who've tried all these medicines and TMS and all these other things, and they come to psychedelics, and it's their sort of last hope, and of course this is going to work, everybody says this work, uh, and for whatever reason it doesn't work for them, um, those people are in a, a pretty bad state. And they are few and far between, but it does happen. There's, you know, I email you every once in a while about this. Like, There's some people who just don't respond to mushrooms. God knows... If Paul doesn't know, yeah. God knows <laughs> why some people aren't responding to mushrooms. And we do know, I, pu I published a paper about people who'd been on SSRIs for a long time. And when they came off of SSRIs to do an MDMA study, the people who were never on SSRIs had a big, robust response to MDMA. The people who had been on SSRIs who had come off had less of a response. I don't know if that's the case with mushrooms or not. I've talked to some underground people who feel like the people who've been on SSRIs for decades don't have a robust response to mushrooms even if they come off. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that there, I definitely know about people who came off their meds to have these experiences. It wasn't what they, I just talked to an underground person recently who, who got sort of some negative feedback from the person who complained, I didn't get enlightened, you know? <laughs> I thought I was gonna get enlightened. And you know, it's not just a one and done. There's this whole process and you may have to do it a couple of times and you need a lot of support between and you need a lot of support after, as you said. Yeah. It's really this whole, you know, yeah. as much as people talk about integration, they throw this word around. It's the after that really matters. Well, there, there's also a fundamental flaw, unfortunately, with clinical trials. And it's extraordinary to me that more clinicians have not addressed this early on. Increasingly, they are. It's the placebo blind double control. Right. And you, the one group's supposed to get a placebo, and the other group gets a high dose of psilocybin. There's a great cartoon, many of you have seen it, I just love it. And the person, they're sitting in, in a patient group, you know, there are six of them sitting in their chair, and the other six are dancing around, you know, and they go, he, the person goes, well, I guess we're in the placebo group. You know, and this is a, actually a, an ethical issue because you're treating somebody with treatment-resistant depression. This is the end of the line for them. Nothing has worked. They're hoping they get psilocybin. 
Well, what's the ethical responsibility of the conditions right. that are exacerbating their depression? They thought they were going to get psilocybin. They get a placebo, and then they use that as a yep. baseline right. for the comparison of the people who have an improvement. I mean, it's, a, it's really yeah. fundamentally flawed, and there's 25 to 30 right. of these clinical trials that are using in, inactive placebos in contrast to high doses. I mean, this is just yep. right. scientifically well, impunable, and I don't know how they got yeah. past the IRB boards on this. Yeah. And it's the hubris of scientists, especially scientists who have not tripped, right? <laughs> who they looked at this as some other type of medicine that they think they're going to know it all is in designing clinical trials. And then I think it's, it's a serious, I would take every clinical trial with treatment resistant or major depressive disorder that use a high dose of psilocybin with a placebo and you know, look at them, you know, just very circumspectively as being, you know, inflating their data because of the contrast. And what's the moral responsibility right. of causing these people to be more depressed because they it's, were deselected? It's true that in some psilocybin studies, the only suicidality is really in the placebo group. It, group. I just said group. In the placebo group. Um, it's incredibly disappointing, right? And, and when people ask me about whether they should try to find a study or try to go to somebody underground, and we talk about all the risks and benefits of that, I talk about the fact that most clinical studies is a 50-50 chance you're going to get the medicine. So you have to be willing, you know, you're really doing it for science. You can't do it for you. Um, and I've been arguing against placebo in this forever. And I'm, I'm in the process of helping to design a study, very early stages of using MDMA in the treatment of people with schizophrenia. I, I refuse to have a placebo in that, Thank you. that group. First of all, people with schizophrenia are sometimes pretty paranoid. I don't want to play games. Who's got the button, you know? They just... <laughs> So I think what we're going to do is everybody's going to go through with placebo first so they get the lay of the land and understand how it works, and the second time they will get active drug. And it, we'll just know it, and it's okay because you do know it. I mean, unless you're going to put dilating eye drops in every person, uh, which would be one way. I've, I've been talking about midriatic drops forever because to me it's a very easy, cheap way to at least make everyone look like they're tripping who's in the study. Can you explain that? I'm not quite familiar it's with it. It's an eye drop that dilates your pupils, so you get the big basketball pupils that one may get when they're taking a psychedelic. Well, that's good for the, do the doctors looking at pupils. It would at least be, well, it would at least help the doctors think everybody was tripping, but also, when you get that much light in, things look a little trippy. So it's something. Have you ever not gotten your pupils dilated for eye exam? Paul, you need oh, to yeah. go to the eye doctor. No, no, I, uh, uh, it does, right, believe it's me, a I, little I, reminiscent of MDMA or psilocybin when you get that kind of increased light coming in. Yes, but you know, this is like even when people look at fractals and geometrical patterns, you know, it's just not it's like VR. And VR is a wonderful toy. Again, technology getting ahead of itself. But with VR, it won't make you have the feeling of unanimity that wells up inside of you when you're tripping and you feel this yep. one with the universe it's not just fractals and geometrical patterns and and visual effects it's something that's deep inside of your core that wells up and that is so different than what a vr experience can give and so these again clinicians that are using vr who think it's oh yeah we can induce a psychoactive experience well yeah. you can get part of the way there but it's not the same thing. Yeah, and also a lot of people don't have visuals or aren't very uh, visually oriented. There's something called aphantasia that a lot more people have than we realize. And it's uh, some people they can close their eyes and image. You know, they can they can visualize their mother's face or you know what they ate yesterday or something. Other people when they close their eyes to visualize, it's just black. That's called aphantasia. And so a lot of people with aphantasia don't have a lot of visuals anyway. So if they're just focusing on the pretty colors, they're really, they're certainly missing. I'm so neurotic. I think you just gave me aphantasia. Like, I've been wondering why.